You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. This is the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell a security or to provide investment advice. Welcome to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. OIC offers a variety of resources to those interested in learning more about options, including live seminars, webcasts, and podcasts. Check out www.optionseducation.org for more information. Now, here's your host, OIC's Director of Retail Education. Education, Joe Burgoyne. Today's program is a rebroadcast from OIC's webinar program. Every month, we do webinars on a variety of options-related topics. Check out optionseducation.org for more information. Enjoy the show. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get started. Thank you for attending the latest installment of the Options Industry Council's webinar series. My name is Alexander Osinga, and I'm a staff member here at the OIC. I'll be guiding you through today's session. Do earnings and listed options go together? We're glad you could join us to learn more about options as a flexible, powerful trading tool. And today's webinar, moderated by OIC's own Joe Burgoyne, will be discussing with a panel the important factors and specific option strategy ideas for investors to consider during earnings season. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Joe will introduce our topic today, Do Earnings and Listed Options Go Together? Joe? Alex, thanks so much, and thanks to everybody, as always, for joining us. Great to be back with you. I think it is a dynamite topic today. Um, you know, earnings, we talk about movement in the marketplace, and uh, what better product uh, to support movement in the marketplace than listed options? We have two great panelists, longtime pros, joining us today. First, uh, Marty Kearney, representing uh, MyAx. Marty, uh, say hello and tell uh, tell our listeners, uh, you know, about what you've been doing for all these years in the market. Well, uh, Joe, thank you very much for the last week. I've been uh, praying for the Chicago Cubs, but it hasn't been working. So, uh, <laughs> no. But I've been uh, I started out uh, as an individual investor many many years ago. I was a floor trader for 16 years and. A couple of those years, I helped start a little securities firm in Chicago, and they're still around and doing well. And I was on the staff of uh, the CBOE for 18 years, and uh, now I just do a little consulting on the side for our friends uh, today at the uh, Miami Exchange. So I'm glad to be well, here. We're, lu we're lucky to have you. Appreciate it a lot. And uh, joining Marty today is uh, our friend Kevin Dabbitt. Kevin is with uh, the CBOE's Options Institute. Kevin, uh, say hello, and why don't you tell our listeners about your background? Joe, you even got our new name right, the SIBO. Well done. I applaud you. That's new as of yesterday. So uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm happy to be here today. Um, my background is somewhat similar to Marty's, but I like his joke about when he started, they were uh, etching trades into stone tablets. I came along a little bit later. Uh, I was 
on the floor as a market maker, well, first a clerk uh, and then a market maker for the better part of eight years. Since then, um, I've traded options on the commodity side of the business. I have worked with clients, and for the past couple of years, I have spent my days working here at the Options Institute where we uh, are advocates for, for these products, and hopefully we can continue to spread that word this afternoon. Well, I think we will. Great, Kevin. Uh, thank you both. A uh, little house, I guess, uh, housekeeping before uh, we get into the content. As I think most of our listeners know, um, options are not suitable for everyone. You know, they they involve risk, but they're benefits and risk to the listed options product. And and hopefully that's why you've joined today to learn uh, both sides of that equation. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the OIC, we're in the process. We just uh, rang in our 25th anniversary. We are the educational arm of the listed options industry, funded by the exchanges in the OCC, uh, and we love bringing unbiased educational content to you. Um, the OCC, one of the primary funders of OIC, is uh, the Clearing Corporation, which frankly uh, sets the listed options market apart, uh, guaranteeing each contra side for each trade that takes place on the listed options markets. Uh, we're down to five parent exchanges, as there's been some consolidation in the industry, SIBO, NASDAQ, Box, Myax, and the New York Exchange are the five parent companies in the industry at this point. And I won't spend a lot of time on, on you know, one of my very favorite slides here, but um, you know, it speaks to an industry that started from nowhere in 1973, bottom left-hand corner, 16 underlines, traded in April of 73, calls only for the first four years of the industry. Um, we start, of course, at the Chicago Board Options Exchange, the CBO. Uh, over the next 20 years, another uh, four exchanges were added. And so by the late 90s, you know, there were five exchanges. And, you know, volume exploded in the late 90s, early 2000s for a couple reasons. We went from singularly listed uh, equity uh, listings. So rather than one bid and offer spread, you had five as the various exchanges listed all of the various underlyings. And then uh, at least as important and maybe more so was the uh, invention of electronic trading in the listed options market with the ISE, which is now part of the NASDAQ. So, uh, you know, with that, we had a 10-year uh, wild expansion of industry volume, as you can see. And, and what I think is something to take note of over the last half dozen years, we've been averaging somewhere between 16 and 17 million contracts a day, and that's despite an incredibly low volatility environment. So uh, despite little movements in the market, it's clear that investors have embraced this product, uh, be it for income generation, risk management, all kinds of different reasons to uh, you know, be using a listed options product. But uh, this slide here, I think, uh, tells a, a pretty good story of the history of, of the industry. Uh, today we're going to cover, as you know, this is all about uh, listed options around earnings. So uh, we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time talking to Marty and Kevin about implied volatility. We'll go through a couple different uh, strategies potentially, and then uh, certainly we want to take time for your questions. Speaking of questions, we've got a couple we want to start with to get a sense for your experiences in the marketplace. So if you would, um, answer the following uh Polling question, do corporate earnings announcements keep you out of the options market at that time? If you wouldn't mind responding yes or no, and uh, that will give us a sense of exactly the type of attendees joining us today. So two-thirds uh, are in the market around earnings. So. Kevin and Marty, this is uh, this is why we do these polls to you know give us a sense for who we're talking to. And uh, one another one, do you initiate option positions within a week of earnings announcements? Yes or no, please. Okay. Um, Interesting. Almost fifty percent do. So uh, I think we have a lot of folks uh, online here who. Uh, understand the options market pretty well. Well, we, we do want uh, 
to focus on on the implied volatility effect. So one more question here, and then uh, we'll bring in Marty and Kevin. Um, not just at earnings times, but all the time, do you as an option user pay attention to implied volatility levels in your option positions? Not a surprise, uh, Marty and Kevin, given uh, the response to the first two questions, almost uh, four out of five do pay attention to implied vol. So with that, um, how about if I start with you, Marty? Um, you want to just maybe start the discussion about um, how important you think implied volatility is in the option space and then especially around earnings? I, I think implied volatility is very uh, important. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, and hello, Kevin. Uh, one of the things that happens is that there's always volatility. There's always uncertainty in the marketplace with either uh, the market itself, a particular sector, maybe a stock that, that you're taking a look at. In implied volatility, it's we're, we're not going to do math today, okay? Although uh, Kevin and I uh, might throw out a, a, a shortcut for you a little later to, to look at uh, the potential move in a stock with earnings. But the implied volatility is an annualized number that is kind of converted back into how much of a move are we expecting at this point in time, knowing everything we know, which includes maybe earnings coming out next week on this particular stock. So implied volatility, as you would imagine, as we're going into an earnings announcement, it's very high. Why? Because there's a great deal of uncertainty. The stock could be much higher, could be much lower. Uh, or, you know, once the earnings come out, it goes back down to its more historical level. I pulled up uh, implied volatility. Now, some of you are, are seeing this on a, on a delayed basis, which is great. But uh, this morning, uh, or I'm sorry, yesterday afternoon, IBM had its quarterly earnings. And the stock did very well, and the stock's up like 13 points. But the implied volatility yesterday, before the close of trading, had the implied volatilities in, of, of the at-the-money option, all right, the stack w was somewhere between 146 and 147, the implied volatility was between 48 and 49%. Now, that's a pretty high implied volatility for IBM. And what happened then was IBM came out with earnings that beat uh, expectations. The stock did very, very well, and it moved up. It closed up about uh, 13 points, almost exactly 13 points, but the implied volatility of the at the money, now this would be the new price that IBM went up to, about 159.5, dropped down to about 23. So the implied volatility was half of what it was the previous day. So going into earnings, you can expect a lot. You know, we could be much higher, we could be sharply lower, we could be unchanged. But in this particular case, this just shows why it's so important to at least be aware of the current level of the implied volatility as to what the market made up of all of you people with your bids and offers on different uh, option series is saying, this is what I think the expected outcome could be. Marty, fantastic example. Kevin, I'm going to come to you in just a minute, but Marty, I want to follow up with you. Um, you, you mentioned that you know those implieds were in the high 40s before the earnings announcement, you said, you know, that was pretty high. How, how does an investor know that those high 40s is a pretty high level? Well, I think you can you can go to your, uh, and, and obviously the OIC has a wonderful uh, a bunch of resources as well, but you can probably go to your uh, broker's website, and they have some free tools that are available to you telling you historically this is what, and let's just use IBM as an example, historically IBM has traded at X volatility. I'm, I'm thinking it's probably less than 20%. But all of a sudden, over the last two or three weeks, the, the implied volatility in IBM has raised higher. What does that tell you? It just tells you there's something going on. There's news coming out. And this is where you should decide, is this something that I'd like to participate in or I'd like to back away from? And it looks like the, the trading crowd was kind of 50-50 on that, which is fine. But as long as you're aware that there is news coming out and it's reflected in higher call and higher put prices, then you can make a decision as to what's the strategy you'd like to employ. That's, uh, that's just a monster move involved. But, you know, that's what makes the options market so exciting when you get oh, involved absolutely. moves like that. Absolutely. So, Kevin, absolutely. how about um, – 
I don't know, and it's not about Top and Marty's example, but uh, how about if you offer your insights and, and how you think about, you know, implied volatility in the marketplace every day and then especially around earnings? So, as usual, I think Marty covered that really well. Um, and I suppose we all kind of think about similar things in, in just a way that that works for us. And oftentimes when I'm talking about implied volatility, which is critically important, um, from, a, from a floor trading standpoint, it's arguably more important because you're kind of managing an inventory of volatility and you're not trading price on options. And that's what I did for years. But now... Uh, more often than not, I'm, I'm, I am trading kind of a price or a range, but understanding the role that implied volatility plays in that potential uh, break-even point or range is super important. So when I talk about the option pricing model, um, we, we all know pretty much four or five, depending on whether there's five or six inputs, and that depends on whether an underlying pays a dividend. We know it's not a mystery where the underlying stock price is at, what strike price you're trading, how many days there are until expiration. You know, interest rates can change, but they don't do so dynamically. And then a dividend if your stock pays it. You make an assumption. The marketplace comes to a, a broad assumption on how volatile that underlying market will be over a given time frame. Okay? And it's often informed by historical volatility, but uh, in around events like earnings, you see or you, you often see this ramp up into the event and then a return to a mean reverting volatility. And so understanding that, whether you're just trading kind of directionally or you're just trading price uh, is, is super duper important. And it seems to me like, and, and just based on the, the feedback from the, the early poll questions, that most people probably already understand that, so we don't need to belabor the point, or hopefully not. Okay, I, I think you're, you're spot on, and I see actually uh, a question coming up. Well, I, I want to back up a second and ask both of you a question I was going to start with, but I got all excited about implied vol and went straight to it. Um, Marty, do you are, are you a believer that options, the listed options product, is is the right product to be in around earnings? Oh, absolutely. You know there there are, you know, in, investors use um, uh, the option product for for three. I think uh, three main reasons. You know, they they like to either uh, hedge, they like to generate some income, or they're taking a directional opinion. And, and the directional opinion doesn't necessarily have to be bullish or bearish. It could certainly be kind of a neutral outlook as well. So, you know, you, you have to have one of those three outlooks. If you say, I'm not sure, then, then don't be using options on this particular stock or ETF uh, at this particular earnings uh, juncture. But, but if you have, you know, an, an opinion, you can parlay that into hopefully a risk-reward scenario that you're pretty comfortable with. So absolutely, I, I think I think you can use options uh, during uh, earnings time, and we're right in the middle of earnings time right now. So this is a this is a good topic at this point in time. Well, we tried to time it that way, but uh, you never know. Hey, Kevin, um, yeah. how about you? Uh, you want to weigh in? Are you you a believer in this product around earnings? Peas in a pod, um, and again, <laughs> Marty kind of kind of spot on, but to. Um, maybe elaborate a little bit on his his point of I'm using them to hedge or for income or directional. Uh, the the bigger point there is you need to you ought to have a plan um, in any market, and whether you trade options or not, that is the case. Like it, it, you could own a stock in perpetuity. But from my standpoint, there ought to be some price at which you would sell it or some plan for that. And the same goes for options. So outlining, what am I looking to do here? What's my, what's my concern and how can I address them? That will often make it much easier to back into what sort of strategy makes sense. And that goes for around earnings or you know, when, when you're not in an earnings cycle. It's kind of a, an inherent um, uh, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, God, I'm sorry. Uh, discipline, where y- you make yourself accountable by having a plan and ideally writing it down and uh, thinking about things in terms of, all right, I'm looking to hedge. What sort of strategy should I do around earnings based on that? Or I'm looking for uh, non-directional exposure. What does that lend itself to? Write it down and stick to that plan. Stick it to the plan. Joe, um, Joe, Joe I was ahead. just going to say, what, what uh, and, and th- th- this isn't, you know, definite, absolute things you have to do, but, but I'll tell you, this is what I do when I'm coming up on earnings. If, if I, and I, I had no uh, option position yesterday on IBM, so f- full disclosure. Um, if, if I were going to play a particular stock, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the implied volatility. I'm looking at historically what has it been. That's fine. But then I'm taking a look at what has happened with the stock over the last eight earnings period. Uh, I, I take a look at a two-year chart. And I, I go back and look and say, you know what, uh, you know, four of the times the, the stock has done very, very well, and three of the times it's done nothing, and one of the times it's done very poorly after the earnings report, just to give myself a little bit of a larger picture, you know, as to, as to what I'm expecting could happen on, on this particular uh, movement, okay? And if, if I'm not sure... If I'm looking at something next week, for example, I'd be using the options for next week. If there were weekly options, not all stocks have those, or I'd be looking at the following month, which would be November at this point. But you don't have to stay in until the earnings announcement. You know, you could put a position on now. You could exit the day before or two days before the earnings announcement. So some people like to put the position on to to take advantage of, of their opinion. Some people like to put the position on, and as the implied volatility rises during, you know, as we approach expiration, they might say, you know, I put this position on for three dollars, and it's now trading for three seventy-five, and you know what? I'm I'm just going to get out of this, or you know, I, I've changed my mind. I'd like to get out of this before the earnings report. So, I'm not I'm not scared about hanging onto a position until earnings, but I know when the earnings are due. And I kind of have an idea of how this stock has reacted in the past. And obviously, I think you said it in your opening statement that you know past performance is no uh, indication of what's going to happen in the future. But but I'm very aware of what this stock has done in reaction to earnings in the past. Makes uh, an awful lot of sense. Obviously, doing your homework and uh, with all the resources. Uh, you know that the the exchanges, brokers, and OIC offer now. It's it's not all that hard to to do that homework. You just have to, as you say, Marty, uh, have the discipline and 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 the plan, and then and then stick to it. Now let, let's see. I got a couple questions coming in, but I think I'm going to piggyback what you talked about, Marty. And you know this whole idea of okay, we're coming into earnings. We've got an options position. So. Um, but two different scenarios where maybe you initiate that position well in advance of earnings and then sell that position before earnings or potentially carry the position through earnings. Now, to me, that's almost uh, not necessarily two different types of trades, but, you know, and Kevin, maybe you want to pick up on this, differentiating potentially between maybe a volatility trade or a delta trade. Um, is that is that enough of a question for you to respond to, Kev? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and I think that in large part piggybacks what I harp on maybe too much, but having a, a plan that you intend to stick to. So the, the the financial world has become increasingly quantitative. And if we just back up a little bit, was it last week that uh, Richard Thaler won the, the Nobel Prize in economics and, and he's kind of really given rise to uh, the, the acceptance of behavioral economics? Left to our own devices, we will often, um, uh, we will often be wishy-washy if a position goes against us. And so if we are able to behave more uh, rationally, in, in and around trading, I think we end up typically being better, and I can anecdotally talk about the people that I think uh, that I know did really, really well in this business, and oftentimes they, they were the most disciplined. So um, if I set out to uh, trade around earnings or what have you, and I say I'm doing it for this reason, reason whether it's 
volatility play or directional. And I am looking to get out if this happens. Or if this happens, then you you have already set the 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 groundwork for all right, if that happens ahead of earnings, fantastic. If it happens afterwards, so be it. But really you're just sticking to the game plan that you had from the outset. Um just touching on the directional and what Marty talked about as far as allowing history to be a guide, this information is readily available now. And having some sense of uh, a typical earnings-related close-over-close move is a really, really good idea. And I'm, I'm contrasting that to I'm going to buy some cheap options because I think this is going to be the the cycle where where XYZ goes up or down 20% when statistically over the course of the past, I'm just picking a number here, three years, that has never happened. Um, that is not a, a strategic way to trade options and be long-term successful. Now I'm just going to briefly plug something that a colleague here does, Russell Rhodes, um, will will typically put up a blog over the weekend during earnings season that highlights all underlying securities that have weekly options available on them. And he looks at the average high low uh the average high yeah, the average high biggest and, and biggest gain and biggest drop on those securities in the past twelve earnings cycles, so three years. And that can be incredibly informative, whether you're trading around that event or not. So I would I would recommend taking a look at that. And uh, Kevin, just uh, can you repeat how folks might be able to find that? I mean, I know Russell's got the oh, blog. I apologize. Cause... Yeah. So yeah, it, uh... it is on the the CBO site, cboe dot com, and then it's forward slash blogs. And those typically go up on on the weekend in advance of, you know, like last weekend would have had your average high-low in uh, Netflix and, you know, IBM as as Marty's example. Um, so, and then the follow this weekend he would put up those for those issues that have weekly options available and earnings in the coming week. CBOE.com forward slash blogs. Okay, very good. So, uh, you know, listeners, uh, we got we got uh, Marty at, at eight cycles. We got Russell at twelve. So uh, it's not about throwing darts here. It's about doing your homework. But I think uh, you know we got a bunch of folks on who, who know the implied space and probably know that already. Um, hey, Joe, I have I have one other thing too. And uh, using IBM is a terrible example because the, the stack moves so far. Um, but but I'll tell you two things that that, that I take a look at. One is if if I have a winner, okay, and I occasionally have a winner, you know, even the, the broken clock is right twice a day, right? <laughs> but, but if I have a winner, and, and like I say, IBM's a bad example, but if I were playing the uh, earnings, I would be playing the front week or the front month. So this would be, we're, we're taping this on a Wednesday, the 18th of October, so I would be playing the October 20th weekly options, or that's the regular expiration options, I believe, okay? Yes. Uh, yeah. but, but what I would do is this. With IBM opening up sharply this morning, okay, it was up about, uh, I think it was up about $10 or so this morning at the opening, I'd be out of half of my position near the opening, okay? So let's just say I bought 10 of these options. The at-the-money options were going for about $2.80. Uh, I'd be out of half of those. That, those are the 146s, 146 strike price calls. I'd be out of half of the, those uh, options at the opening. Now, why only half? Well, number one, I'm greedy, okay? And number two that all the analysts have been talking about on the business channels today has been about IBM this and IBM that, and we're raising this and we're raising that. I might hang on to part of that until tomorrow, Thursday. All right? But I'm out of this at some point on Thursday. There's, I don't want to hang around for the last little bit on this thing. Okay? So I have a plan that, you know, get, get out of half of it when the news comes out, get out of the other half, you know, sometime before expiration. I'm not going to hold it right until expiration. What Kevin said is critical, though. What if this didn't work? Well, you know what? You, you want to move quickly, you know, because that, that implied volatility did not drop from 48 to 23, bang, at the opening bell, okay? You know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if near the opening bell the implied volatility is 
35 and 20 minutes later it's trading at 30 okay so if you have a loser you have to move quickly you know you have to manage the losers that, that, that that's critical in in trying to have a game plan uh, to to make a little money over the long term makes a lot of sense now let, let's stick with the IBM example um, Alex is actually sending a question Marty and I'm going to send this to you uh, you know, as regards to IBM, would the rise in implied volatility have told you which direction the stock may move? Any any uh, any feelings no. about that? No. Okay. And and here's what that means: implied volatility. We're just talking about. We're, we're going back to if if you can kind of envision everybody the bell-shaped curve, okay? And that's how Kevin and I got through school, and Joe tried to wreck the curve, being way over on the right side, uh, pulling the, the scores up in the class, okay? But. <laughs> What we're looking at here is that, you know, most of the outcomes are in the center. Most of the time the stock, you know, it'll move three or four points or two points or whatever. It's not going to move very, very sharply. Now, one standard deviation, and we're kind of stuck on IBM today, and it was not my intention. I, I didn't mean to commandeer the, uh, the talk. One standard deviation with the stock at about 146.5, ballpark-wise, one standard deviation higher was about 153 and a half okay so about seven points so what that means is is that statistically you we've got a you know about a, a little over a 50 percent chance that this stock will trade between 139 and 154 about seven points higher seven points lower IBM moved one and a half standard deviation so this was a an unusual move okay so if you had been call buyers or anything with a bullish strategy, you probably would have done very, very well with IBM. But high volatility doesn't say moving higher, moving lower. It just, the higher the volatility, it's kind of like they flatten out this, this bell-shaped curve. I've, I've got you pictured in your head. But the wings are moving out a little farther. So higher volatility just means, you know what, we expect to move further. Now, with, with implied volatility at 23, I'd be surprised if, you know, one standard deviation for next week isn't only three or four points. Why? Because the right. news is out, isn't it? Okay? Exactly. And one shortcut. I'm going to give you one mathematical shortcut because Kevin and I are, are math challenged a little bit. If you don't know how to figure one standard deviation, that's okay. You, you can look it up, and it's a very simple calculation. But what I do is, as most lazy traders do, I take a look at the delta. Now, this is not technically absolutely correct, but one standard deviation should be close to about a 16 delta. So if you're saying with XYZ has earnings next Wednesday and the stock's trading at $50, what is the market looking for? Well, you know, all of a sudden you're taking, and this has one-point strike prices, let's say, you might find out that the 154 call has a delta of 16, you know what? What, what, they're, what they're saying is is that you know, we've got about a four-point uh, move would be one standard deviation, and then you can set your either long option or short options accordingly as to what you think, will we go past one standard deviation or not in one direction or the other. So look for the delta. It's close to one standard deviation, a delta of about 16. Love it, Marty. Outstanding. Uh, Kevin, I got a question coming in, and you were speaking to this uh, just a little bit. And by the way, Marty, I think, uh, you know, sticking in this whole uh, universe of IBM is perfect because it's live, it's happening, and uh, these are these are real-life examples. So I don't think mm -hmm. you're commandeering anything. Um, okay. But Kevin, um, you know, there's, there's again, another question uh, rolling in. Somebody's uh, saying... You know, how do you anticipate the amount uh, that a, an underlying may move in advance of earnings? This particular individual looks at the at-the-money straddle and takes 85% of it. Any reaction to that approach, or do you have your own approach? Um, no, that that particular question or trader seems uh, systematic and probably well-informed. So. The options market are arguably as efficient as any in uh, indicating or pricing event risk, and that's just a, a maybe a fancy way, probably not that fancy, but one way of saying that at the money straddle more often than not is is correct. 
is right in giving you some indication of anticipated move. Now, we, we have spent a good bit of time talking about IBM where that was not the case and that absolutely occurs. But more often than not, and I think uh, to, to use this, this um, whoever asked the question, their, their point about taking 85% of that, I would like to turn it around and, and say why 85%. That's interesting, um, and that probably is backed up by some historical data. But uh, I, I would say whether you, you take a position or not, you would probably be shocked at how frequently the range going into an earnings event uh, mimics the close over close outcome uh, following the event. So let me just, because it's one thing I followed today and have to a certain extent, but Abbott would fall within the range of uh, the options market being efficient. They announced earnings, so they're a, a, a relatively local Chicago company in the healthcare uh, industry, and they had earnings this morning going into earnings. The straddle was a bu the 55 straddle was a, a buck and a quarter. Uh, if you think in percentage terms, that was implying like a two. I'm sorry, like a 1.8 percent move uh, on its highs today. It, it had moved a buck sixty. Uh, it closed up seventy cents. And so, what would that be? Just again, anecdotally, that's fifty-six percent of the straddle. Um, so, m more often than not, and this is just going to be one other brief anecdote. But I was talking to my my colleague Russell about this before this, and saying, you know, is there anything you would you would point out? And he said. Uh, that weeklies, so we're in the standard expiration cycle, but weeklies certainly allow you greater precision to trade around that event if you want. That's probably obvious to most of the audience. But then he said he had run uh, a study for a year on the At The Money straddle, owning it, getting out on the following day, and then waiting until the end of close, like another day, so, and the, the brief takeaway from that, and this is not some advice, nothing, but just to a testament to the, the efficiency of these markets. The straddle, if you bought it going into the event, sold it on the opening the following day, you could, over that long haul, make a little bit of money. If you waited until the end of that next day or the, the following day, you typically lost a little bit of money. So this is sort of riffing on what Marty pointed out about you know, get out or get out of some on the open. And then if you wait, that volatility is likely mean reverting and uh, it, it's probably priced efficiently. So whatever that means. I, I like that particular question and their approach and it seems um, regimented and that's a good idea. And Kevin, just to, could, could you repeat, uh, what's the symbol for that particular stock? Oh, I apologize. Abbott is A B T, Apple okay. Boy, Texas. Got it. I thought you said Abbott. I just wanted to be clear, make sure everybody heard. It. Very good. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, in terms of, well, you know, we're and, and it's a great discussion, guys. I appreciate uh, the wisdom here. How about if we? Do uh, you want to talk a little bit about uh, position types? You know, going into earnings, and again, whether that approach is five, six, eight weeks out uh, to be sold in advance or to take it through? Uh, Marty, would you, would you like to touch on a strategy yeah, if, or two? If, 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 if I'm going out uh, five or six weeks out, um, I, I'm, I'm usually not going to be too concerned about um, earnings. You know, I, I'm, I'm okay. going out uh, – this is what I'm doing right now. I, I have some long-term plays on, but, but if, if I'm using this to trade a little bit, I'm going out two weeks. I'm – putting a position on with the intention that I'm going to take it off or, or maybe it's a credit spread and I'm, I'm uh, hopefully going to have the thing expire. But I'm, I'm not really too concerned about um, earnings per se. Now, if, if the, the question was uh, back to one, I, I think you started out with uh, Kevin with, you know, put the position on with the idea that volatility will rise. Yeah, it will, but, but then you're kind of married to that position uh, over the next 
six or eight weeks, and you still do have time decay. So you do have implied volatility probably going higher traditionally, but you also have time decay with the position. So I'm not, I'm not going out that far. You know, if, 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 I, if I go out that far, I'm putting it on, I'm taking it off. But if it's earnings related, I'm probably putting something on a week and a half, two weeks before, and then either close it out be- right before or hang on to it and close out, you know, some on the news and, and some possibly the next day after the news is out. And um, in terms of position types, do you want to walk us through, I mean, do you, do you look at the underlying, do you form an opinion, bullish, bearish, or neutral, and then look at implied and then decide what you want to do? Could you just walk well, us ab- through that process? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking at support and resistance. I'm looking at moving averages. Um, it's funny, over time, uh, I've changed the moving averages that I look at. You know, when I was an investor, I'd be looking at a 50-day and 200-day moving average. When I was a trader, I was looking at, uh, I was comparing the 10-day to the 25-day, believe it or not. Uh, not. Now that I'm not trading anymore on the floor, I'm looking at the 200-day, but one of my <laughs> trader friends has, has convinced me that the 75-day moving average is more accurate than the 50 so now I am, looking, I am comparing the 50, the 75, and the 200 to tell me are there any crossovers or are there things that I'm not seeing that, um, that, that would help me make a decision. And by the way, I always, uh, e- even if it's, if it's not an earnings-related play, I do like to take a look at a chart, but then occasionally I will just, by the way, l- let's go back and look at that chart over a year or two years. Maybe there's a bigger picture. You know, in other words, maybe we're forming a little bit of a bottom here, but if you look at a longer-term chart, yeah, but you know what? We might bounce a little bit, but we're not going to bounce that far because you know, we have some strong resistance, maybe a little closer than I thought that I didn't see in a short-term chart. So I'm, I, I get into more of the technicals, I think, than, than I probably should, but this is just the way I've, I've traded over the years. And let's say, um, you know, maybe you have and, – and by the way uh, – you know, does that 50, 75, 200 uh, versus the 10 over 25 help your blood pressure? <laughs> at times, at times. Okay, very good. Um, if let's, let's just say it's a bullish scenario. Do you have a, a favorite strategy or two around, you know, a, a bullish earnings play? Or, you know, it, it really well, depends. You know, I, I think sometimes you can make it more complicated than you need to. You know, I, I mean, like if you just would have been an outright call buyer of IBM, the at the monies were going for – 280 and and you know they're trading for 13 dollars right now once again a bad example okay but no you, you I, can keep I, it pretty it, it, it's that i Go think ahead. that's a great example your point your point before of you could you we we have this tendency to make it more complicated than need be i think that's the takeaway and things like ibm clearly do happen so if that's your bias express it the cleanest way possible and own some calls, or at least that would be my argument. Yeah, and, and the, the thing I do, Kevin, with that is, uh, with IBM, one of the things I was considering yesterday as I, as I was looking at this is, okay, let's just say I'm bullish on IBM, uh, and maybe I'm a buyer of the 146 call. If one standard deviation is 153 and a half or so, since I'm buying a, a 48 or 49 implied volatility, Maybe I would buy the 146 call. I might sell the 155 call. Why? Because that's already up through one standard deviation. It's like one and a quarter standard deviations. Okay. In that case, you know, when you're using a spread, and that was Joe's question, what strategies do you use? You know, when you when you use something like a vertical spread, you're you're kind of removing the impact of high volatility, right? Because I bought an overpriced option, I sold an overpriced option, and the time decay that you bought is reduced by the time decay you sold. Not completely, but part of the part of the time decay your time premium you're buying is offset by the time premium you're selling. So in that case, okay, you know, the, the 146, 155 call spread with the stock close to 159, over 159, okay, it, it goes to what, nine points. Well, I, I think I'd be okay with that. You know, I'm giving up the last two or three points of the IBM move, uh, you know, you can always figure out in hindsight what, what the right strategy would have been. But that's one of the things, Joe, I might do. That that's, If I have an opinion, but I, I say, you know what, historically it's trading at a 15 or 18 volatility. It's currently trading at a 48 or 49. Maybe I do a vertical spread and offset the cost, limit my potential gain, 
okay? But still, I would offset some of the downsides of buying expensive options. Makes sense, Kevin. Um, you know, keeping it simple makes sense, certainly. Do you prefer, um, you know, the spread approach around earnings, or, you know, does it depend on each particular scenario for you? If, if I had to answer yes or no, it would be absolutely yes, but in real life there would be a but following that. But I do think circumstantially there are situations where – this is cliche, and I probably say it too often. Uh, options trading, whether it's around earnings or not, is part science, part art. You've got to understand the foundational stuff of how options behave and, and why, that, that critical underpinning. And just based on the, the poll responses earlier, I bet a lot of the audience already does. The art becomes um, really knowing the product that you're trading and why, and that's something that you develop, or in my opinion, you develop over time. So that's me hedging my response there in that um, there's a time and a place, and to Marty's point, yeah, it's easy to say afterward. Uh, just a couple thoughts on, on what he was talking about just a couple of minutes ago. I like the perspective. You know, we may be trading – short time frame, short durations, but sometimes uh, taking a, a more macro view and, and, and moving out, looking at your chart over a couple of years can really change your perspective, your outlook. And so I think that's a good habit to be in. And then another thing that I was taught early on in this business is thinking about um, implied volatility as synthetic time. So that's not uh, all that overwhelming. If you just think about your at-the-money option, um, I talked about Abbott a couple of minutes ago, so we'll, we'll do that again. And let's say that you have been trading around 55 where it has been for two weeks, and you see volatility moving up into that, but really – the, the fact of the matter is, is that that earnings sensitive straddle just isn't changing its value very much. Like let's just say the, the straddle was a buck and a quarter a week ago and it's a buck and a quarter with a day to go. Really that, that is maintaining its value because implied volatility is moving up and that's not all that unusual. So um, I think spreading by and large will keep you in the game more often than not, limit your potential gains as well as your risks. And so in a vacuum, I would, I would advocate for that if you're trading earnings. Okay, let me follow up with that, Kev, just a little bit on the art side. You know, you're, we're referencing uh, on and off the implied volatility charts. Um, do, you, do you view them uh, much as you do a stock chart uh, with support resistance lines? Uh, you know, what's your approach to the vol charts? Um, I have, and I'm not saying that, that this is the right way or wrong way, but some sense in my mind of where uh, typical earnings-related volatility is and what a mean is afterwards, so a relative high and low. And um, some underlyings behave that same way. So, yes, but I'm not, I'm not getting – too deep in the weeds on a volatility chart. I'm, I'm, I have kind of general rules of thumb, uh, and I might need to look at that chart just to make sure I'm not totally off base. Okay, very good. Marty, anything to add in the vol chart space? No, I, 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 think, I think Kevin covered it pretty well. I mean, it, everybody should be aware of, of volatility. You know, it, it, even I, I, I was thinking of a story that isn't really related to, to trading options, but uh, I, I know a broker outside of Washington, D.C., a very nice guy. Uh, he uses options for all of his clients, even the clients that don't trade options. And, and the, the, the explanation of that is, uh, Joe, you're a younger fellow. I'm a little older, okay? If, if he has two stocks that his company likes, and they're both trading at $50, and you don't use options, okay, he might say, well, what is the implied volatility of stock A and the implied volatility of stock B? They're both $50, and maybe his firm says, we think these are $60 stocks 12 months from now. 
he looks at the implied volatility, and stock A has a very low implied volatility, and stock B is in the stratosphere. Well, that's where he might say, you know what? For Joe, the more conservative investor, longer-term investor, I might, you know, buy the stock in, in stock A. You know, for for you know Marty, who's a little bit, uh, you know, he, he's got a little, little bit different view on, on trading. You know, he he, he likes uh, to have a little more risk. I might put him in stock B. So there's so many things that the, that the option market can tell you uh, as to what's going on, and it's especially it jumps out at you at earnings with the, the jump in implied volatility. But I don't, back to uh, uh, Kevin's comment, I really don't uh, chart implied volatility. I'm just very aware of where it's been over the last 10 days or the last month or the last quarter, and I know what the implied volatility is today. That's a snap, snapshot of today's uh, implied volatility, but I don't really chart it. Okay. Um I, I do want to, you know, maybe have us talk a little bit about the short side of things, and of course, just being short, whether it's straddles, strangles, uh, calls and puts. I mean, obviously, it's it's all about managing the risk. Um, but before we get to that, Marty, a uh, couple of the uh, you know attendees are asking where can they find the uh, standard deviation uh, numbers for their stocks. Is is there well, a you know what I, I like? like to go? Um, yeah, I, I I do like the the comment by the. Um, uh, the, the attendee who, who talked about 85% of the straddle. I mean, th that's how I think the people on the, some of these option shows talk about it, where, you know, the expected range is four points. Well, they're taking, you know, 85, 90% of the straddle, the closest in straddle, to get it that way, or they're taking a look at the delta. You know, you don't have to know how to do the math on, on uh, you know, what's expected. Just take a look at the delta. A delta of 16 is about one standard deviation. It's not exact, but it's pretty darn close. Okay. And and in terms of actually uh if somebody wants to find out uh their numbers uh for individual stocks, I mean the brokerage firms have all that information generally, right? The, the, the brokerage firms have that. And and yep. the, and okay. you can you can you can you can look up the uh the formula online. It's a, it's a it's a very very simple formula for for figuring it out if you want to and by golly, it, it will kind of coincide with the delta, it will coincide with that 85 to 90 percent of the straddle, believe it or not. Makes sense. Most of okay. the time. Most of the time, yeah. Yeah, most. Uh, no guarantees. Never any guarantees. That's right. That's right. Um, so if, if uh, you know, we're initiating a position around earnings on the short side, um, you know, we, we, we know obviously the risks associated with just being short calls and puts. Uh, are, are there favorite ways i mean credit spreads were mentioned earlier uh any any favorite way like kevin you know in terms of uh you know hedging some of the unlimited risk of just short option positions yeah um i think one of the uh most widely embraced ways to define your risk whether again it's around uh earnings or otherwise would be to turn something like a short strangle or straddle into a uh, a condor. So buying something outside of it with the same expiration. And that will give you uh, defined risk reward parameters. And in the case of a condor, some expected range. And again, this is being strategic about your take a look at everything we've talked about, the uh, historical moves on earnings, what deltas we're looking at. This can all play into where I'm picking what um, strike I might sell and buy on an iron condor. And it just puts you in, probably over the long haul, a, a higher statistical win scenario. Now, again, we've said it a couple of times, but there's no guarantees in this business. But it's being strategic in your trading and being able to repeat that. So, um, what I would say is that if you understand the risk and potential reward of trading around an iron condor, using those in an earnings scenario can make a lot of sense. Hey, Joe. Okay. Yeah, Marty. Just, Joe, just, just so you know, I don't use right now as an individual investor, I do not use naked calls. I do not short calls naked. I have permission to do so by my broker, which is very unusual. I do not short calls, only because... Take a look, you know, here's back to the IBM today, up 14 points, okay? You just would have gotten killed today. If I have a, a neutral to moderately bearish outlook, I will do a call credit spread, 
Okay, if if you know the, the puts is a different story, but on the call side, most investors don't have permission from their broker to sell naked calls because what's the margin? Well, what's the risk? The risk is unlimited, isn't it? So just be very careful of the risk reward. You know, if you can make a little to lose tons, that, that isn't a real good risk reward scenario. No, it's always. Uh... Yeah, you know, I gave a presentation yesterday, and of course, uh, lots of questions. How much can I make? How much can I make? And, uh, you know, hopefully that first thought is thinking about how much you can lose, to your point, Marty. I mean, it's, it yeah. is about risk, risk Amen. management. Uh, guys, uh, it's been a good discussion. Um, any, uh, any further comments? Kevin, uh, anything else you want to add? Um, I think. I think you guys really touched on it, not to maybe to to bring this full circle to Chicago, but again, the batting average is uh, the the Cubs can't win because they are not getting hits in in this series with the Dodgers, and trading and being successful over the long haul is about singles and doubles if you'll you'll pardon the analogy, not the home run and and that is uh something that a lot of people struggle with early on. But the the better you get at being pleased with singles and doubles, whether it's earnings or otherwise, the the more likely you will be able to do this and do it successfully over the long haul. So discipline. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Marty? Yeah, the, the, uh, two things. One, one of the strategies we didn't talk about that, that um, I, I do like is a time spread. It's also known as a calendar spread or a horizontal spread, you know, where if you think the the, the – Particular options in this front week are very high compared to back months. Maybe I will buy, you know, an out-of-the-money put going out four weeks, and I will sell the one-week out-of-the-money put to take advantage of selling that time premium. So time spreads, whether they're, they're if you're bullish, it's a call time spread. If you're bearish, it's a put time spread. If you're neutral, it might be an at-the-money call or put time spread. But time spreads are, are something to consider, and I think you have some videos at your educational site there, Joe, that they can look up. Uh, and the other thing is that just because implied volatility is high doesn't mean you need to sell it. You know, if, if implied volatility is high, there's news out there, and your homework assignment is find out why is, why is the implied volatility so high. It might not be earnings. It could be a product announcement. It could be a competitor having a product announcement. So that's where you have to... Do a little digging and do your homework before you put a position in. Excellent, Marty. Well, Kevin and Marty, uh, uh, just thank you very much for uh, the great information. I hope our attendees enjoyed it as much as I did, and I'll uh, turn it back to you, Alex. Thank you, Joe, and a huge thank you to the panelists for sharing their time today and their insights. Um, And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining us today. While we weren't able to get to all of your questions, we have our investor services desk ready to help. Feel free to reach out to them at options at the OCC.com. That's options with an S at the OCC.com. Again, today's session will be archived and will be accessible in a few hours using the same link you used to join us today. For further education, please visit optionseducation.org, the OIC's website, and see the Getting Started section for further reading. If you'd like to discover more, be sure to check out our upcoming events and register for our webinars and seminars if we're in your area. We will uh, host two webinars next month where we'll be returning to the basics and providing an overview of concept, concepts essential uh, for options beginners. You can register for our next webinar by clicking the URL link icon at the bottom of your council. And uh, be sure to follow us on social media, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter to stay current with OIC's latest offerings. Thank you again for attending, and we hope to see you again next time. Investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or 
or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell a security or to provide investment advice. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have questions about anything you heard on today's show, email Joe Burgoyne at options at the OCC.com. Or you can call OIC's Investor Services at 1-888-OPTIONS. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Like the OIC page on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter at options underscore EDU. Or join their group on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. And be sure to check out our next episode of the wide world of options. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.